Mobile phone towers, we've feared them for decades. The digital mobile phone boom of the late 1990s and early 2000s saw these newfangled digital towers going up all over the place. They were installed in rural areas, in built up areas, on new towers, on old towers, on rooftops and in streets next to people's homes. People really kicked off. There were TV documentaries on this new fear and this was all fuelled even further in the mid-2000s with the rollout of the new Tetra airwave system for the Welsh Police Forces. This mass migration to a mobile phone type digital radio system, to put it simply, saw the rollout of thousands of new O2 cell towers. Then came the cancer scares and stories of disturbed sleep patterns. These mobile phone towers were reported to impair cognitive function, affect children's school performance and even harming babies in the womb. The cell companies tried to alleviate this mass fear. They disguised towers. Some were trees, some were coated in fancy wallpaper. They were hidden inside fake chimneys, in lighthouses, behind false facades and even inside faux wooden poles. The years went by with this whole debate rumbling away. Moving into the 2000s teens and 20s, and we're now used to this infrastructure popping up everywhere. We need it too. These devices that we've become glued to, that we run our entire lives off, need this infrastructure. Then COVID-19 happened. While most of us were isolating at home, anti-5G protesters took to the streets. They spread the idea that COVID was linked to 5G. There were also attacks on telecoms workers and almost a hundred mobile phone masts were set on fire in the UK. In fact, May the 3rd 2020 was named by campaigners as International Burn Down a 5G Tower Day. The government, and this is true, had to put a message on their website saying that viruses cannot travel on radio waves or mobile networks. Coronavirus is also spreading in many countries that do not have 5G mobile networks. But where did this link come from? Well, it started with one doctor. On January the 22nd, 2020, a Belgian newspaper published an interview with an Antwerp-based GP. He said, and quote, 5G is life-threatening and no one knows it. The doctor didn't just claim that 5G was dangerous, he also said it might be linked to coronavirus. A journalist pointed out in another article that since 2019, a number of 5G cell towers had been built around Wuhan. Could the two things be related, he said. I haven't done a fact check, he cautioned, before saying, but it may be linked with current events. Comments like this were quickly picked up by anti-5G campaigners. There were petitions, protests and the vandalism of thousands of towers across the world. Almost all of the conspiracy theory posts linking 5G to coronavirus made use of the overused and mostly debunked theories about non-ionising radiation, chemtrails and deep state plots to use vaccines to control people, all of which is of course complete rubbish. So are these 5G towers dangerous? Well, first I have to point out that these conspiracies came with the earlier mobile phone networks and not just 5G, so this isn't a new thing. Despite research and scientific evidence, over recent years public opinion has been swayed by inaccurate non-factual reports and conspiracy theories that state mobile phones, and particularly 5G, presents a danger to the public. The reason I thought I'd make this video is due to the many comments I get on this subject, and when I ask people to provide me with solid evidence that 5G is harmful, I almost never get a response. Now, it's my opinion, based on what I've read, that 5G and the whole of the country's mobile phone system isn't dangerous in its current form and configuration, and that's the important bit. Microwave ovens are very dangerous outside of their configuration within the home, but completely safe to warm our food. And this brings me on to the next bit. The type of radiation used by our phone networks is classed as mainly harmless or in scientific terms non-ionising when used within guidelines and that's the important bit, just like our TVs, remote controls and home Wi-Fi. It's widely recognised that the strength of the signals is extremely weak and therefore doesn't have enough energy to cause adverse health effects. The evidence from official and independent studies which can be found online and in the description below says that the strength of the signals is extremely weak and therefore doesn't have enough energy to damage DNA or directly cause cancer. 
Many people who are concerned about 5G and cancer cite that the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified mobile phones as possibly carcinogenic. This date backs to 2011 following a series of studies that were not considered conclusive, nor did they take into account factors that could distort the data. Mobile phone signals were therefore added to this category as a precautionary measure. To put this in context, talcum powder and eating pickled vegetables are also classed as possibly carcinogenic. It's widely recognised that non-ionising radiation is not capable of directly causing cancer when used within guidelines. A test was done in 2016 on people who claimed to suffer adverse health effects due to exposure from mobile phone and cell tower radiation. The subjects used reported sensing either radio frequency or extremely low frequency fields within minutes of exposure. Participants were visited at home or another location where they felt comfortable to undergo testing. In short, testing consisted of a series of 10 exposure and pretend exposures to RF in random sequence. No participant was able to correctly identify when they were being exposed better than chance. So, why do people fear cell towers? Well, let's go and chat with Rory, who will give us some insight into this phenomenon. Okay, so, Rory, explain to everyone watching this who you are and, and why you're qualified, for want of a better word, to, to have this conversation with me today. All right, well, first of all, thank you for asking me be back. Some of you viewers might have seen me reco recollecting my uh, days on CB and ham radio in, in one of the other episodes that you've done. And my career is actually, I'm a psychotherapist, a counsellor and a psychotherapist. I'm um, a former lecturer of counselling, so I'm a qualified teacher. <clears throat> I taught for over a decade. Um, I run um, my own internet business with a business partner. Um, part of my work now is research. So as a teacher, I taught psychology, and I also taught criminology, psychology in terms of criminology. One of my interests at the current moment is belief systems. Why people fall belief systems, sustain belief systems, and um, why sometimes people convince themselves of things that aren't true. And I'll be, before I finish, just say that I did in 2015 win a teaching award. I was on Britain's Classroom Heroes um, for outstanding use of technology in education. And I'm also... Um, a licensed radio amateur so I suppose you can you can sort of look at this impartially and, and as a bit of backstory I asked you to sort of go away as um, as somebody that's that's impartial and research and and come back and sort of explain um, this sort of phenomenon um, that is this belief that 5G in its configuration that it is in the street monopoles and transmitter sites is dangerous so so what I suppose what did you what did you come back with and and do you feel it's dangerous or have you have you sort of found evidence to suggest that it's that it's perhaps not? Okay, so so I think possibly it might be useful to explain that <clears throat> what I'm going to share with with the people who are watching this aren't my opinions. They are views taken from research. So as a researcher, what what you would usually do is you'd go to authoritative sources. I do what would be called a literature review or a paper review. And to do that, you would find authoritative sources um, in the medical world and in, in you know, the, the world of telecommunications. And you'd look at papers. And crucially, those papers, papers that people have written and their own research, would be peer reviewed. In other words, a, a panel of their peers would review the paper and make criticisms or observations. And finally, research is ongoing. Just because we know something's correct today, yeah, doesn't mean that tomorrow we'll we might not change our mind. So there are things we we can agree on. Things like gravity, um, that's sometimes referred to as a paradigm, and a paradigm is effectively something there's a broad consensus on. But generally speaking, there's a lot of topics out there where people are researching, and our minds change as we go along. What we knew yesterday may not be no, yeah. not, not be no tomorrow. So you asked me the question, is 5G dangerous? And I think that's really, really interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. And the first stop I went to was the British Medical Journal. And I found, um, interestingly, a essay 
in the British Medical Journal, and its headline stopped stop global rollout of 5G networks until safety is confirmed. And what the what the paper says is effectively there's a lot of things we don't know. And in fact, some more recent research uh, published in the International Commission on the Biological Effects of Elo Electromagnetic Fields, and that was published in October of 2022, um, says that the FCC, which is the American equivalent, yeah. I guess, of, um, you know, regulatory bodies. Yeah, so it's their equivalent of, of our Ofcom, basically. Yeah. yeah. Says that um, in, in this particular piece of research, says that the, the actual uh, data they have may not be accurate. Yeah. And it may be that there needs to be more studies to actually work out, is it safe? The... <laughs> What I've drawn from the research is that um, you'd have to be pretty close to the transmitter to yeah. Yeah, to, to get any 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 effects. Yeah. And also, uh, from what I can gather, 5G radiation it pretty much doesn't penetrate the skin. Um, yeah. It kind of bounces off or, or, or yeah. penetrated. Yeah, you, you, you're probably more likely that, that, there's, that you have more exposure to RF from... Um, let's say a router in your home than you do a a 5G transmitter and a lot of people say they comment saying that you know how harmful how dangerous it is the fact that they're being put near schools and things like that but um, a microwave oven is very dangerous without the shielding in place that, that that's on it and in the current configuration that these transmitters are in where they are where they're located where they've been to the power they use the frequencies yeah there's just isn't there isn't any credible evidence and i say to people show me show me a credible source that says that that transmitter um or that antenna on that mast is is harmful to a human being in its current configuration and no, nobody ever has but it does strike me that there is a bit of a parallel with in terms of speed because obviously 5g is about speed yeah. connection with perhaps the birth of the railways robbie lewis stevenson when he um, talked about railways and the Stevenson's rocket, there were yeah. medics at the time who said, oh, we, you can't go faster than so many miles an hour. Yeah. Your lungs will be sucked out of yeah. you. Um, and it's, it's interesting because they probably believed that was true. And it was only yeah. people rode on the train and came off and they were fine. Yeah. We realised actually that wasn't true. Yeah. I suppose an interesting point with this as well is that I suppose the concerns people have haven't stemmed from 5G. This has been going, and we've discussed this sort of away from the camera. This has been going on since the the start of the millennium, when the when the digital networks, the um, the the 3G networks, started to be rolled out. I remember seeing a documentary in the early 2000s of um, it was it was around Wales with mobile phone rollout, and the the it showed a lot of people there that were sleeping in sort of metal shielded beds and they were worried about the cause um so these transmitters causing cancer and yeah so th this has been around for quite a while it has and it's really interesting part of my research took me to sciencedirect.com which again is a quite an authoritative source of peer-reviewed research yeah and there was um there was a um, article entitled the conspiracy of covid19 and 5g spatial analysis fallacies in the age of data democratization, it's easy for me to say. Hmm. And, and what the research pointed to was um, a, a couple of things. One is that the the, the link to, uh, we'll, we'll say flu, has, has been around since, you know, 3G, 4G and 5G came out. And in terms of psychological processes, which is what, what I'm interested in, there is something called base rate fallacy, and that's a psychological theory right. where we rely more on specific information than statistics when we make judgments. Okay. Okay. So, is there anything else that stood out for you in those in those journals and reports that you that you read? Yeah. Well, actually, there, there was. Uh, I think that one of the one of the articles that's in the BMJ, BMJ British Medical Journal. Um, said that existing 4G systems can service up to 4,000 radio frequency using devices, so phones, iPads, whatever yeah. connected, uh, per, uh, per kilometre, per square kilometre. 5G systems will connect up to 1 million devices 
right. square kilometre, greatly increasing the speed of data transfer by a factor of 10 and the volume of data transmitted by a factor of 1,000. Um, and the, 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 the person writing this paper says also there's lots of existed evidence on potential health harms of 5G that have been published over the past 10 yeah. years, but they've been of varying scientific quality. Right. And I, I think it's the I think it's the case of we don't know what we don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's nothing major to to support the fact that it's dangerous yet, but th there'll always be experiments ongoing to to look further into that. So why do people hold on to these beliefs and and sort of keep on to this really strong belief that that they won't be wavered on and and each to their own? This isn't an exercise to mock or or belittle anyone. This is. This is a you know a serious conversation, but why do they, why do they hold on to these beliefs so adamantly? When, if you look in the right places, there isn't the evidence to to sort of uphold this this alleged danger at the moment. Well, I think the first position is that most people aren't researchers. Researchers to, to be a researcher, you have to be taught how to do it, and that's something you you, you do when you're taught how to do research. Yeah, and so I think most people don't have the the tools and i also think that there's another psychological process that comes into play called cognitive dissonance and the best way i can describe cognitive dissonance is you go out and buy yourself a really top-end digital handheld transceiver and you yeah. get home and you think this is the greatest thing you've ever had and then you think oh, God, i've spent 600 pounds on it yeah and you think oh, i'm not sure if i could justify 600 pounds and you get that uncomfortable feeling it's it's where your beliefs don't line up with your actions okay and what happens is is that you get that very uncomfortable feeling and what usually happens it's sometimes called buyer's remorse it, yeah, yeah. It's, you ever heard of buyer's remorse that's a form of cognitive dissonance but what can happen is that people don't want to engage in that awkward feeling and they just stick and they will then what they will do is they will look for facts to back up their okay their belief system yeah and they will go to the eighth degree to to find what they believe is research yeah to, to support their theory and that's usually done by associating in groups on social media like my yeah. people or, or or looking specifically only at the research that backs up their claim okay. as opposed to being impartially going well there's this and there's that yeah and you know, I don't know where it tells. I mean, I think I think the sign of someone who's got an open mind is is they say they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And they're open, you know, for more information to come so they can readjust their beliefs. Yeah. But cognitive dissidents, yeah. So like I said, I've had loads of people that have, have, have spouted the dangers that they believe, you know, the dangers that they believe to me. And I've said, come back with a credible source. And they never do. So what do you think the psychology behind behind that is? Do you think that's a refusal to to change the belief without without having any evidence? You, what what where do you think that stems from? Well, I like the way that you 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 you've conducted the interview with a lot of respect to say that we're not after we, you know you're not after embarrassing people or rubbishing people's views. Yeah, I think that I think for some people there is a, an amount of embarrassment when they realise that actually they're barking up the wrong tree. Okay. And, and they 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 don't want to admit to themselves they've got it wrong. So that would be ego, I guess. Their ego's yeah. dented. And I also think that that some people can convince themselves of anything. Okay. And we're belief generating uh, humans are pattern matching generators. <laughs> so yeah. we look for patterns, and we also look for meaning. And I think that people find meaning. So it might be those people who even in the face of evidence aren't wavering, yeah. might be more interested in the camaraderie of the of the other people who share those beliefs um, and be be happy in, in their belief system. But you're absolutely right. The test of someone who's open and is curious is show me show me the evidence and then go and find you the evidence. And as you say, yeah. no one ever has. Yeah, interesting. And Rory, I, I really appreciate you coming on to um, discuss this as well. Well, thank you very much for hosting me, and and you know I'd leave you. I'd leave by saying, I think an open mind's the greatest thing. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Be yeah. curious. You know, continue follow the evidence, 
and you know make your own mind up but yeah. thank you for hosting me again no worries and, and like i say the, the important thing is that my 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 opinion on this is based on what we know at the moment and of course if the correct evidence comes about then that may change yeah so there you go a look into the whole conspiracy behind 5g cell towers as I've said multiple times, this is in no way done to belittle or poke fun at anybody. Everyone is entitled to believe whatever they want, and of course, if evidence ever comes out that goes against my belief on 5G and human health, then of course that may change. What do you think?